<laughs> and this is the fifth edition of the Summer Aviation Forum. And uh, we started back in 2020 when it was not possible for anyone to have an event, but we organized here uh, um, uh, an event and uh, we continued in 2021. Then 22, 23, uh, we moved to um, uh, other uh, uh, parts of uh, Greece in Europe. And we are back here in, in, in Italy in order to continue this event. A different setting as we feel that to be in a Greek island, as we call Summer Aviation uh, Forum. Uh, air transport and tourists are uh, structurally interdependent. The demand for air transport often derives nature, especially depending on leisure, business, and other tourist activities. Tourists, as we know very well in aviation, collapsed during uh, COVID-19 but it is now strongly rebounding and we expect 2024 is a year in some parts of the world to exceed uh, uh, what was before uh, 2020 uh, or uh, getting to the drastic figures of, uh, um, of 2019. Uh, Greece, of course, is one of the success stories and it uh, uh, rebounded um, already from last year. Of course, we, we need to talk about sustainability and resilience through the major importance for tourists. We saw more and more uh, about over tourism that is again in the agenda. And uh, uh, of course, um, the, uh, the companies, the, 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 the airlines, the airports need to find strategies uh, regarding uh, this and uh, deal with different uh, operational issues. This year, Summer Aviation Forum will bring together leaders of aviation in the United States. And uh, in order to discuss the relation between the air transport and tourists, and the new era and to navigate in emerging geopolitical to see what's happening around our neighborhood and economic uncertainties and of course with the new European Parliament and the US elections uh, and other elections around the globe that affect uh, our uh, business. Uh, this event will not be possible without the support of the sponsors, as already said, with Angelus and Abibrai, and Rare and Herr Michal here, Travel Bridge, later will be here at San Luciano, and Gold Air Airline Services that uh, Nikos just joined, and of course a GM that is uh, helping at the uh, uh, official uh, air uh, carrier sponsor. Uh, I don't want to talk more, and then um, I will pass the floor to uh, the first keynote address we have for today, and it's Ragnar Yogutak who is the Managing Director uh, of Airlines for Europe, to give uh, his uh, keynote address. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kostan. What a pleasure to be introduced by a fellow Greek. I don't have to correct my last name. That is me, what you just said. <laughs> once every five years. So thanks a lot. And thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm the Managing Director of Airlines for Europe. That's the trade association based in Brussels, representing Europe's biggest 17 airline groups. Um, it's a team of 10 sitting in Brussels and trying to influence and shape future policy for airlines and for aviation in Europe. And so I'm invited, I've interpreted my invitation to you today, uh, as an opportunity to set out what I think is biggest challenge we have ahead of us for the next five years and to take into account the recent EU election. Um, first to say, summer is looking good. We already checked back in uh, February, March, and we sold by Airlines to Europe across five major markets. We're back to 96% of 2019 levels. Some of our members are above 100% of 2019 levels, so summer is good. We expect about uh, 96 people, 96% of them are going to fly, and about 75% of them are going on holiday. People want to fly. People enjoy flying. When you ask them, what do you care about most? What is the biggest challenge? Cost. 31% talk about the cost. Mm -hmm. I just want to be the biggest concern. When you ask them, what is it that you think airlines should be working on for the future? They say sustainability. No cost. Sustainability. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things we need to get right over the next five years. Um, as, a, as an industry, we have an aviation decarbonization roadmap that was set out not just by airlines that are working together with the airports, with the uh, air traffic uh, controllers, uh, with the OEMs, the plane makers. We need to 
wasn't the credible and we need to stay on track. So, so we will come out of a period of uh, heavy regulation from the EU. I, I don't even count how many rules we received, but fundamentally we need to make progress over the next five years to demonstrate progress and demonstrate we are getting to net zero because people care and people are, are waiting. And I will talk a bit later about do the new EU regulators care. That's, that's a different question. But people care. The people who fly care. That's their top concern. Will we solve this problem? To get there, I guess the biggest part of the roadmap in this nation from the decarbonization roadmap is two big elements. It's new planes and new aircraft technology. That's about 38% of uh, how we're going to get to net zero by 2050. 46% is staff in sustainable aviation fuel. And I think that's really the biggest challenge we have ahead of us today. We have rules, we have mandates, the EU loves to legislate. We are the most ambitious region in the world when it comes to targets for sustainability and for a fast lending mandate. We also have very little production happening. There's we often the discussion around the tariff that says the EU, the US, which has the uh, inflation reduction app, which is actually incentivizing South manufacturing here to try to put lending mandates, does that work yet or no? Uh, my personal view as someone who's been doing trade associations and EU politics for about two years now is that Europe is great in legislating values and ambitions and it's terrible in making money out of it. So we had the most ambitious renewable energy target back uh, 10, 15 years ago. And we ended up importing photovoltaic panels from China with Paris. Right so that is an opportunity to decouple energy from where it's actually made and its availability across the world. Anybody can make that if you just put a bit of, bit of good sense in there. And a bit of you know, money. Um, so for me, taking the lead in Europe in staff production and the next generation of staff production is I think the biggest opportunity we have to reach the targets of uh, that zero, but also to gain a competitive advantage in what is actually quite interesting technology and technology that many people will start using around the world. It's not just Europe that has decided to legislate around the uh, staff mandates. We already have this need. Singapore, India is thinking about it, even China is thinking about it. So this is the future, and it is an opportunity. Uh, what do we need? Money, for sure. We, I, I hope that in the next uh, round of politicians to come to Brussels in a couple of months' time, we get uh, people who want to do a sound industrial strategy. We want to talk about rolling out and implementing the rules we already have. Some more incentives, definitely there. Is it feasible? A lot of people ask me, I think it is feasible. The South is thinking of that. We were with uh, Sky Energy, we launched a report that mapped the availability of staff manufacturing across the world. And they say, uh, it was published a couple of weeks ago, you can find it on the website, it's good news. They say that if you take the EU announcement alone, and the credible one, so they, they collected about, I think, 240 announcements, and they cleaned it up, and they arrived to 150 or something like this. They say that those announcements that look credible can actually deliver the quantities we need by 2030. So it can be done. But when you look at that map in today, 40% comes from the US, the incentive story, uh, and 85% is HEPA. So we're not investing in the next generation, the e fuels, hydrogen, that kind of thing. So I, I really hope um, that we can get politicians to embark on this adventure of let's invest in staff, let's invest in the funky technology in the next generation of staff as well, and keep it ahead of the edge. Let's put our innovation and research money in there as well. And let's make sure we have the quantities we need to meet the mandate and, and to keep our license to fly in people's heads. That's the most important thing. And that brings me to the challenge of, um, of the EU election. I think when you're looking to spend this much money, and just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude, APRIN members have committed about 14.8 billion euros by 2030 just for the staff, just for the mandatory staff. And we've committed another 165 billion euros in new planes and new tax. So that's just for the 2030 mandate. So when you're putting that kind of money into doing your business and, and taking it to the next level and taking it to the next generation if you like, then what you need is policy to hear. So you will hear me, and I'm promised in my hearing the meetings, and please pick up for me. No backtracking. You can't go back. As soon as the politician starts saying, ah, can you do it, and then you do it as CEO or the, uh, 
in the airport or whatever, because they had super complicated and go to make it, and when people lose that belief, then people stop investing money. Already today, we're trying to convince the investors. I spend most of my days lately, but I'm going around talking to the school suppliers and to investors and investment banks and, uh, and research funds that you can do something different. And come on, you need to be very vocal about how there's a, a secure demand. That's what the legislation really does. It guarantees the market. You know people have to buy it. You have to supply it and people have to use it. So the market is not the problem. The demand is not the problem. We can invest in the output in the manufacturer. So no bad here at the and I really hope that whoever comes into town, we are good at convincing them that this is something we need to roll out. This is good for Europe. This is about competitiveness. It's a big buzzword um, in Europe. Um, it, it will give us a competitive advantage globally, and it will keep us flying. On the competitive edge, I really hope that these new regulators understand that the is a global business, that we don't get dry in Europe, and that we, you know, great rules which are just principles and don't result in pragmatic, implementable stuff. It doesn't really work, doesn't help anybody, doesn't even get the business and even get to Europe. Um, I see a challenge that there might be a bit less here out of the next round of Parliament and, and regulators that we can use. You, you must have noticed the cost here of the third to three, and then you're right. Um, people are questioning the green deal and the impact of sustainability, and they are questioning are we doing the right thing? It's a time where geopolitically we're not feeling very sensitive. It's human nature to look at yourself and those close to you and not take the bigger picture. I started EU politics about 20 years ago. Uh, so in 2004, in May, we expanded the EU to the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and it was taking an amazing time to be European and to be in Europe, which is buzzing. People love Europe. I mean, I finally took a plane and went to Poland and the Czech Republic and made their funny little bullet thingies, which are really strange, but actually very good, and drank everybody's palinka, and they had my uso, and we all agreed to do business together and that we can actually work together and like each other, and that's here. And we can't go back from that. So I, I really, really think that it's important to help people continue with the more Europe. So not legislate just for legislation's sake, but even single market for aviation has to keep it. Have to keep it. It's the most liberalized transport mode we have. Have to keep it. Have to keep nourishing it. Um, going back from the thing of I'm going to cap uh, uh, ticket prices here, I'm going to maybe cap in luggage free there, I'm going to cap on how many flights can take off of airports, I'm going to put them in passenger tax. All of these little individual fragmented there and see the talking with the initiatives, miss the big picture, and I like Europe. And what we need today is, is more Europe. So, that's what you would hear a great talking about, and I think it's important that we all work together to, to help move the thinking along, that, that we have enough in common, that it's a great challenge, but that aviation can do it, together we can all do it, um, and that we need a bit more Europe, no backtracking, a bit more Europe, and I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you for having me.